Okay, let me start by thanking the other organizers for making ISPCM a huge success over for seven long years, and it seems to be getting better every year. So uh, I'm going to again, you know, present some really, really fresh data. Um, so uh, I'll start by focusing on the background. So it doesn't look very clear, but what you see here are uh, uh, colloidal particles that we've synthesized in our laboratory. These are uh, soft and deformable and highly polydispersed P NIPAM particles, okay, thermoreversible colloids. So, um, and if you look at these particles, you'll see that the polydispersity is continuous. Normally, when you do experiments with, you know, jammed colloidal systems, you form these jammed colloidal systems to make sure that they do not crystallize. You use bidispersed uh, colloidal particles. So, you take two different sizes of colloidal particles and you mix them together. And that's the easiest way of experimentally making a glass. Okay, but uh, my student Sanjay, well, my ex-student now, he just uh, submitted his PhD, uh, PhD thesis earlier this uh, month and has left. So he basically devised a, a technology to uh, synthesize particles with a continuous size distribution. Okay, and uh, uh, so uh, I will, so basically we want to look at the jam state of this uh, colloidal suspension. And much of the data taking as well as the synthesis and the analysis was carried out by Rajkumar Biswas, who's also a student in our group. So colloidal suspensions have, there are you know many, many reasons why colloidal suspensions have been used as model, uh, model you know, I mean, model atomic system because colloidal particles as models of atomic systems because colloidal particles can be treated as scaled up versions of atoms. Okay, they have large sizes, they're very easy to see under the microscope, their dynamics are slower as a result, and therefore they are fantastic to do experiments with. So, uh, and you know, for instance, you know, the, the sequence of phase transformations in an atomic system, as you decrease the temperature, for instance, those things have all been reproduced using colloidal suspensions, where temperature, increasing temperature is basically replaced by a change in volume fraction, okay? So increasing temperature corresponds to decreasing the volume fraction. So on the left side here, I have a very famous uh, diagram from, uh, of the evolution of viscosity in an atomic system in, well, several molecular systems. And you can see that the logarithm of the viscosity, which is plotted versus the inverse of the temperature, it shoots up when you quench the temperature, when you quench the system really, really fast. The same thing happens in a colloidal system. So this is a colloidal suspension when instead of quenching, when instead of reducing the temperature, you increase the volume fraction, okay? So this is a, a good ad hoc kind of a one-to-one -one, uh, superposition that we can do uh, if you want to transform the results of a molecular system to a colloidal system. And as you can see in this molecular system, you have these two distinct branches of the evolution of the viscosity. So this is the Arrhenius branch, the so-called strong glass. This is the fragile branch. You can actually reproduce the same things in a colloidal suspension just by changing the stiffness of these particles. In a, okay, so here's a picture of a jammed system in everyday life. So this is just a market, okay, with a huge crowd of people. You can also think of, for instance, buses or you know, train platforms or wherever. And in a jammed situation such as this or on the road with you know, lots of traffic, there'll always be little areas that will be able to move a little faster than the other regions. Okay, so uh, in, similarly, in a polydispersed colloidal suspension at a rather high volume fraction, you can have these regions of dynamical heterogeneities that arise because of the, uh, because of the presence of uh, fast and slow moving regions, okay? And experiments and numerical work have shown that the dynamics of these clusters of particles, these cooperatively uh, well, these, well, these particles become increasingly correlated in space when you, uh, when you approach the jamming transition, okay? So we wanted to make these particles with a continuous size distribution. So we had to come up with the following protocol. So in a reaction vessel, we uh, carried out this free radical precipitation polymerization reaction where we took a, took a monomer of NIPAM we used a crosslinker, a co-monomer, and an initiator so that your polymerization reaction is initiated, and it all happens in this bow, in this in this reaction vessel, okay? 
So basically the NiPAM particles, they polymerize to form P-NiPAM hydrogels. Okay, so these are particles that, you know, highly cross-linked particles that look like this. Uh, so in this method, there are a couple of different ways of doing it. What I'm showing you is what is called the semi-batch method. You get rather homogeneously cross-linked P-NiPAM particles, okay? Uh, and uh, one thing that we do find is that, so one parameter that we can adjust in these experiments is the flow rate of the monomer and the cross-linker into the reaction vessel. And depending on the flow, link, uh, depending on the flow rate of this monomer and the cross-linker, we can actually... Um, uh, we can control the polydispersity of the particles that we are synthesizing. Okay, so this has given us a fantastic handle on the polydispersity of these particles. Okay, and like I said, we get a continuous size distribution as you see here. So I don't have a lot of data, just two data points. So uh, the, in the first experiment, uh, where we used a flow rate of about 0.8 ml per minute, we synthesized these particles. Okay, so the reason why it looks like this is because this is taken under a confocal microscope. So in addition to the reaction that I showed you earlier, we also had to bind a dye. Okay, because you have to use a laser light for the imaging. And if you see the, uh, you know, these little dots here, they are about 500 nanometers, well, 800 nanometers across. That's the, that's the average uh, diameter. And they are rather polydispersed, but not extremely, extremely polydispersed. So just by counting particles, okay, the first thing we do with images such as this is we have to grayscale the images, okay? And there are two things that we can calculate. One is, of course, the center of motion of every particle in this frame, which is about a thousand particles. And also we can calculate the volume fraction of the, well, the area fraction of the particles here, okay? And having done that, uh, we can also count, we can, we can measure the sizes of the particles, and that's what you see here. So this is the... And you can see that uh, the average diameter here is about uh, 800 nanometers or so. And uh, the width basically helps us define a polydispersity uh, index. Of course, we force fitted it to a Gaussian. I completely agree that this is not a Gaussian. But uh, just to define the PDI, we, uh, we define the polydispersity index as the width of the Gaussian fit divided by the mean. Okay, and we took these particles, we diluted it, and then we got a particular area fraction, we diluted it a bit more, twice, and then we got three different area fractions. We tracked the particles, we tracked the center of mass over several frames, okay, and then, um, and then we've averaged over all the different particles in the frame. And then, uh, so this is for three different, this is the mean square displacement versus time for three different area fractions. And you can see for the highest area fraction here, there is a weak caging behavior, okay, which uh, breaks up at uh, larger times as well as when you dilute the suspension, okay. So there's a fluidization of the suspension at higher area fractions. Now using the data, using the MSD data, we can calculate a two-point correlation function or an overlap function, which you again see here. This is how it is defined. For the three, the same three different area fra uh, fractions, the L here is a preset probe length. Okay, that is the length at which the degree of the heterogeneity is maximum, which we calculate by, uh, which we, uh, so it is, it is basically the length at which the, the fourth order correlation function gives us a maximum. Okay, so the fourth order correlation function is calculated like this. It is the variance of this overlap function. And it basically tells us, tells us how the dynamics is correlated between two points in time, 0 and t, in two spatial points, 0 and r. Okay? Huh? No, it's 2D. So we didn't really use the confocal, uh, yeah. So, and the, the height of the peak that you see here tells you about the number of uh, dynamical heterogeneities in the medium and the, the location of the peak tells you about the uh, time scale that basically corresponds to this uh, heterogeneous dynamics. Now we've repeated that this at a slightly higher polydispersity. So if you look at the particles here, the particles are actually a little bigger than the ones that we synthesized earlier. The scale bar is the same, but then you can see that they are way more polydispersed. And by counting the particles one by one, and by calculating this uh, uh, distribution and then by force fitting it again, we get a polydispersity index of 18, which is double of what we had earlier. 
we prepare similar area fractions again, and we see very much the same things. So again, here is the overlap function, and you can see that as the area fraction increases, the, uh, the dynamics become slower, okay? The, the relaxation becomes more stretched. And uh, when we use this data to calculate the chi-4, we find that the peak, okay? So we see a peak in the chi-4 only for the largest area fraction, but upon dilution of the system, the peak goes away, okay? So basically, the dynamical, the dynamical heterogeneities have disappeared and the system is fluidized. Okay, so just as a comparison, what happens when we increase the polydispersity? So this is for the uh, polydispersity of 9%, this is for 18%. Uh, so notice the scale here. Um, this is the, the chi-4 for the, uh, the suspension with the lower particle polydispersities. You can see it is, the peak is much, much higher than in the case with the higher polydispersity, okay? And it is also shifted a little to the right, though it is not really obvious from this figure. And as I already mentioned, that at even higher area fractions for the higher polydispersity, the, uh, the chi-4 completely, it goes to zero, okay? It's not measurable anymore. So just to conclude, because I have time, uh, we have measured the non-Gaussian dynamics in suspensions of colloidal particles, jammed colloidal suspensions, of continuously varying sizes as opposed to bidispersed suspensions. Uh, the, clearly, the increase in particle polydispersity fluidizes the suspension. Decreasing the area fraction also fluidizes the suspension. We are obviously, we can't, uh, you know, continue with just two PDIs. So, I mean, we are uh, synthesizing particles of several other different polydispersities up to 50%. Today, I could show you only 9 and 18. And uh, we'll also go to much higher area fractions, which is also doable. And uh, eventually, of course, we want to calculate that elusive quantity n core. Okay, so that can be done using this, as well as by just doing a free particle tracking and by looking at, by physically looking at the particles that are moving faster than the rest of the particles and by looking at the cluster sizes. So thank you for your attention.